Well, Happy New Year. It is a new year. Yeah, you can say Happy New Year. That's good. Um, just to clarify before we get in, it is 2022, all right? I like to say this at the beginning of every year uh, in this new millennium because, um, or decade, whatever it is. I get them all confused, all right? Uh, but it's not 2022. That's just too many words, all right? It's 2022. For those of us that lived through the 1900s, that's how we spoke back then. We may have forgotten it, all right? But it's 20. 22, and as we kick off this new year, we're in a season in the life of our church that we do in the beginning of every year that we call Abide. Now, as we get into this, I want you to know I'm uh, a little congested and stopped up, and all you here on the front row, I'm just going to spread a bunch of germs to you. Um, it's a total joke, by the way, all right? Um, I was sick over the break, but I have recovered, and then I was working outside yesterday and just, you know, dust and stuff, and so it got me congested again, but I'm going to do my best to get through the message because I think it is a message that we all need to hear and be reminded of in the beginning of the year, and what I was just saying a second ago is we get into this season that we call Abide. For those of you that have been a part of our church for quite some time, you know that we set aside time at the beginning of every year for 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, if you're new to that, I know that may sound like a long time, but there's a biblical reference to that. There's a, the idea of taking these 21 days to set aside at the beginning of the year to pray and to fast, and I'll get more into that in just a little bit, but it's a season that we are thinking about you know, resolutions. We are thinking about uh, things we want to do. We're thinking about goals, and that's a good thing to do at the beginning of the year, and so in that mindset, I want us to talk through what our one goal for this year should be. So if you have a Bible, we're going to be in Philippians chapter 3. You can open that up. It's in your New Testament. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21 is where we're going to hang out today. And in this chapter, the Apostle Paul was writing to the Philippian church, and he was talking about his one goal. He was talking about how he lives his life, what he is straining forward towards, and I think for us, what we need to understand is what Paul was telling them would be really, really helpful for us to understand, to say, man, I want that same type of goal. And so we're going to go to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 21 is where we're going to hang out. We'll kind of split it up into two sections, and we're going to do the first one, 12 through 16. So let me read it, and then we'll talk about it. He says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own. Because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do. How many things does he do? One. one. If you're new, I like for you to call and respond. Only when I ask, all right? Let's try that again. But how many things? One. one thing. If you're online or in Jasper, let's try this again, everybody. But what? One, one thing. One thing I do. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So Paul says he has one thing. Now, as you're reading that, it, it may look like on the surface that he says, I have one thing, and then he tells you two things. Now, if you ever read Paul or you read the Bible, there could be times where you are like, oh, what are you talking about here, Paul? Um, you just said you have one thing, and then you just told us two things that you do, forgetting the past and straining forward to the future. But these two things, or, or, or these one thing really is, has two parts to it in the sense that what Paul is talking about here is a matter of focus. And by definition, when he is looking at one direction, he is not looking at the other direction. Now, we know this to be true, based upon how people drive today, right? I don't know if you've experienced this driving down 575 or 515 or any other road around, but if you've gotten behind somebody and you realize that like the road is going this way, but all of a sudden their car starts swerving this way or that way. Now used to, we used to think that that person was under the influence of some type of drug or alcohol. Now we know they're just under the influence of social media. Right, Because they're on their phone, almost always. You can tell. You can tell when someone's driving and they look down at their phone 
And all of a sudden, their car starts to swerve off into one direction. And I've, I've said this many times here before, but I really struggle with road rage. And so if I get behind someone like that, I consider them very dangerous, and I normally will go around them, honk my horn, hold up my phone, and then keep going. Because, you know, it's my job to correct everybody. <laughs> but it's one of those things that it just bugs me. And I, and I don't know if you know this, but our state several years ago passed a law that we are now a hands-free state where you can't talk on your phone you know, by, by holding it. It has to be wireless, which still amazes me that people think that that means they can talk on speakerphone. Have you noticed this one? Now, if some of y'all do this, yes, I'm talking about you. <laughs> people think that hands-free just means I'm talking on my speakerphone, which another pet peeve. I'm just gonna get them all out in 2022, all right? <laughs> I don't understand you people who talk on speakerphone in public places. I don't get it. You're like walking down the aisle at Target talking on the phone. I don't want to hear. And if I'm the person on the other end of the line, I will tell that person, take me off speakerphone. And if they don't, straight up, I'll hang up. Because I don't want to be on speakerphone. None of us want to hear what you're talking about anyway. So, okay, back to the idea of focus. <laughs> the point is, what Paul is saying is you can only focus on one thing. You can only focus on one thing. And his focus is not looking backwards, it's looking forward. It's looking forward to the goal of the upward call of Christ. And, and this idea that so many of us think that we can multitask, oh, I can multitask. No one's saying you can't do multiple things at a time, but what we are saying is you can't do any of them that good because it's a matter of focus. By definition, you cannot focus on more than one thing at a time. And what I'm saying as we get into 2022 is we should not have a list of goals that we want to achieve this year, but we really only have one goal. Now, here's what I mean by this. I don't know how much of a goal setter that you are. I am not a huge goal setter, and I'll explain to you why later, which you know, makes me, I don't, you know, I'm not quite type A. I'm really type O, positive blood. That's what I am. Um, but a type A person has a list and wants to check them all off. I'm not quite like that. And, and I used to wrestle with that. I, I used to, because uh, people would always ask me, even leading our church, hey, what are our goals? And it took me quite some time to realize my own personality and how God shaped me, but also the difference between goals and direction. One of my mentors has helped me with this a lot. He said, Jason, what matters most is direction. What direction is your life headed? And goals are fine, I'm not saying goals are bad, but here's where it can become a problem. It's, it's the idea that we have priorities. But by definition, priorities mean I have, you know, I have things that are important to me. And if we have a lot of priorities, then we have no priority. Because there's a lot of things on a list. And so here's what happens a lot of times to well-meaning even Christians. They say Jesus is first. Jesus is first in my life. And then, you know, my marriage is second, my family is third, my church is fourth, my, my work is fifth, you know, my community is sixth, whatever, however you would rank that. And Jesus becomes one thing on a list of things. But how I think it's better to think about it is not that Jesus is first in a list of things, but Jesus is center. So if you think of an idea of a bullseye, which I'll show you a target here in just a little bit, but if you think of an idea of a bullseye, at the center, there's the smallest circle. And so the goal really is not to make Jesus first, the goal is to make Jesus central. Because if Jesus is the center of my life, then I can add concentric circles around that, I can add my marriage, I can add my family, I can add my church, I can add my work, I can add my community, I can add my world kind of moving outward. But at the center of all of those circles is still Jesus. 
And so if I make Jesus the center, and that's my one priority, that's my one goal, is to abide in Jesus. If I make that my center, if I make that my focus, well, here's the cool thing. If I abide in Jesus, if I make that my focus, then Jesus is going to give me the grace I need for my marriage. Because Jesus is the center of it. Then Jesus is going to give me the grace that I need for my family. Then Jesus is going to give me the grace, going to empower me for service and ministry to my church. Then Jesus is going to empower me to be a light in my community, in my world. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because see, what I'm getting at is if you make Jesus a number one in a list of priorities, then you will like, okay, check that off. I spent time with Jesus this morning. Now let me move on to my next priority, and then Jesus is not a part of it. And, and what I'm getting at is simply here. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that's bad per se. I'm just saying there's a better way. And Paul tells us. Because Paul had one goal. What's amazing is this word here, goal, in Greek is literally the Greek word skopos. It's where we get our English word scope. Now, I'm not referring to the mouthwash. I'm referring to the thing that you put on top of a rifle, a scope. And what does a scope do? By definition, it magnifies, right? So a scope kind of zeroes you in on a target that maybe you couldn't see with just your natural eye. It magnifies what is in front of you. And Paul says he only has one scope, one goal, one aim, and that is to press forward into his relationship with Jesus. That's it. That's his goal. And here's what I want us to think. If we have a list of, you know, 20, 40 goals, whatever it is, and again, I'm not saying goals are bad. I'll talk more about those in a second. But what I'm saying is we can't focus on all of those things in any meaningful way. And so therefore, our life is more like a scattered, more like a shotgun approach where Jesus becomes one goal among many and we're kind of focusing and bouncing around as opposed to saying, no, I've got one goal. I'm going to, I'm going to rifle. I'm going to go. I'm going to scope into one aim. Now, just in case you thought that this is not the right way to think, look at verse 15 and 16. I love Paul. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you also. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Here's what Paul said. This is how mature people think. So by definition, if you don't think this way, are you mature? Nope. This is why I love Paul. Paul makes a point, and then he has the audacity to think, to say, if you don't think like this, you're not mature. That's why I love it. And then he says, if you think any differently, God will show you. God will show it to you. He'll show you that I'm not wrong. He'll show you that this is how you should think. And here's what I'm trying to get us to see. If we can zero in our life, I'm gonna use a lot of gun terms. Those of you who are into guns are gonna love today's messages. If you're not, then you need to be, all right? <laughs> but he said, I'm gonna zero in. That's what you do with the scope. You zero it in. When you, when you get a scope and you put it on the rifle, and those of you into guns know you pay way more for the scope than you do the rifle. In a good one anyway. And you zero it in because you realize that the rifle is no good to you if it's not zeroed in, if it's not scoped in, if it is not dialed in. We even say things like this, it shoots true. Notice Paul said in verse 16, only hold true to what you have learned. So if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Our one aim is to abide. Our one aim is to abide. That's our one goal for 2022. Our one goal, our one focus, the one thing that our scope of our life is focused at, to abide 
in Christ. That's the goal. And that's why we're doing this series. You know, there's been a lot of conversations probably in the last few years about simplifying your life. We even have Netflix shows, you know, where we learn how to condo that junk. And, and here's the deal. I'm all for simplification. If you haven't already gone to Goodwill in 2022, you're doing it wrong. All right? You should have already cleaned out some junk in your life, made room for the, the junk that you got in Christmas. And this is one of those practices that kind of makes me laugh every time we do it. Because I am taking stuff to Goodwill that I paid for a year earlier because someone said it was so important to have. Now I'm giving it away for free. Talk about priorities. But simplifying your life is not a bad thing. I want you to understand this. Simplifying is not bad. But what I'm trying to show you is there's better. There's better. Now, if you've been around revolution, you know I like to make up words, and I'm about to make up one for you, all right? So again, if you're taking notes, here it is on the screen. So don't just simplify your life, singlefy it. If you can't tell the made up word, it's singlefy. <laughs> don't just simplify your life, singlefy it. And again, I know that's a made up word. It probably should be in the dictionary. Because what it means is I'm single-minded. I'm going after one thing. Because here's the, the problem when it comes to simplifying. Simplifying is good. By definition, I am making something more simple. I'm making it less complex. And, and as we get older and our life expands, our life becomes more complex, just by definition, right? Once you get married, you just made your life more complex which is why a lot of people can't do marriage well because they can't handle the complexity of it. Which is why Paul even talks about in 1 Corinthians why sometimes it's good not to be married because marriage can muddy the mission of your life. But here's what I want you to see. But marriage is a good thing, watch this, if it's single-fied. If it has one Purpose. Let me ask you a question. What's the purpose of your marriage? You don't have to answer that out loud. I want you to think. What's the purpose of your marriage? I've joked about this before, but on my very first date with Lindsay, which we had our 20-year anniversary this week, by the way. Praise God. Yeah, you can clap for that. 20 years of her putting up with this. It's amazing. But I've joked about this before, but on my very first date with Lindsay, I told her, if you're not willing to live in a hut in Africa, don't marry me because I know I look good, right? But that's not the reason to marry me. It's not even the reason to procreate, although that is one of the main purposes. But I was letting my wife know, or my future wife at the time, she was just a girl that I was eating with at McAllister's. <laughs> if you want to marry me, my, my life's got one goal. It's got one mission, one purpose. And and if you marry me, I don't want that one purpose to, to be complex. It's simple. So the mission of our life is to go wherever Jesus told us to go, which, thank God, we didn't move from Texas to Africa. We moved from Texas to Georgia. Now we just go to Africa a lot, which is great. But when we made the decision to move from Texas to Georgia, it was an easy decision. Why? Because my wife and I were in on one goal. You see what I'm saying? So the mission of everything in your life should be single focused. Because simplify is good, but singlefy is better. Why? Let me show you how it works. To be simple minded is not a good thing, right? In fact, by definition, let me give you the definition of simple minded. Having or showing very little intelligence or judgment. That's simple minded. Now there are parts of our country that think that those of us in the South are simple-minded, right? We got little judgment. We in the South. Oh, you know those people. They simple-minded, redneck folk, mountain people, however you want to say it, country folk. 
as if we don't have doctors and lawyers here in the South and smart people and people with degrees. It's crazy to me. But simple mind, when someone's, oh, you're so simple minded, they are not saying that as a compliment. This is why single is better. Let me give you the definition of single minded. Single minded is this having or concentrating on only how many? One aim or purpose. See, single mindedness is good, single mindedness is biblical. Single-mindedness says my life has one aim, one goal, one purpose, and that's to abide in Jesus. That's my one aim. You could say it in other ways and how the Bible says it. My one aim is to glorify Jesus. My one aim is to make much of Jesus. The one goal, the one purpose, my one single-minded focus is God. And Paul says, that's how mature people live. So as we kick off this series, what I'm trying to get us to see is we need to singlefy our life. We need to become single-minded people. Now, Paul doesn't just stop there. Look at this, verse 17. He says, brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Notice the very interesting thing Paul says there. Keep your eyes. Keep your eyes looking at the right people. Focus. You say, okay, I want one thing in my life. I want to do what Paul says. How do I do that? Imitate others that are doing it. What's interesting about this word when Paul says, join me or join in imitating me, this word imitating literally is the Greek word, let me try to say this, submetmetes. The English word is symmetry. It's where we get our English word symmetry. Now, if you know anything about the English word symmetry, the idea of being symmetrical is being the same. Both sides match. This side matches this side. And what Paul is saying is, on one side, we have an example, which ultimately is Christ. And so Paul was trying to imitate Christ making his life look like Christ, and now he was telling them, if my life looks like Christ and your life looks like mine, then your life looks like Christ. To be symmetrical. See, to be symmetrical means you have one design, one plan. You walk in one way. The opposite of symmetrical is asymmetrical, which if you didn't know this, anytime you put the letter A in front of a word in English, it means the opposite. So asymmetrical, let me give you the definition. Asymmetrical means this, not identical on both sides of a central line. Let me give you another idea to think about. The word amusement. We have amusement parks, don't we? We have entire industry created to amusing us. Well, did you know that the word amusement is simply the, word, the letter A put in front of the word muse, and, and muse means to, anybody know? To think. Muse means to think. So if amusement is the opposite of thinking, then watch this. We have an entire culture and entire parks dedicated to just entertaining you so that you don't think. So asymmetrical, watch this, are people who say they have one goal, they they love Jesus, but then they don't walk how they talk. What do we call those people? Hypocrites, that's right. We call them hypocrites. Which if there is one argument against the church, 
from people that are outside the church, it's that Christians are a bunch of what? Hypocrites. And that's true. Now, when people use that line of reasoning, what I say back to them is, well, then you should feel welcome in church. (laughs) Yeah, because you're a hypocrite. Everybody is a hypocrite. Everybody says, yes, this is what I do, and then does the opposite, right? This is why a lot of us have already broken our New Year's resolutions. I said this was my goal, but dead coming, that rocky road looked great, right? I said I was going to the gym every day, and I did for two days. The gym is always busy in January. Come April, it's almost empty. Why? Because we're hypocritical people. Why? Watch this, because we are easily distracted people. Squirrel! Right? Now, if the Bible told me to have one aim and I was the devil, what do you think I would do? I distract you. I distract you. Because if I distract you, then I get you to think that God's just one thing among a bunch of things, and then you just kind of have a scattered life. Now, I just realized I forgot to show you some slides. So production guys, you're already aware of this. Let's go back and show the targets. Let me show you the first one. There is a target right there of a shotgun hitting a target. That's a shotgun approach. Now, I've done my best to count. There's over 200 holes in there. That's a shotgun approach. And a lot of people take this approach to their life. God is one goal among many, and they have a lot of, you know, it's like, I got some in the circle. But anybody who shoots guns, who who knows anything about that, understands no one's gonna put that target up on their wall and say, I hit the paper. (laughs) Right? Because you're like, yeah, bro, you hit it with a shotgun. A shotgun, by definition, is a splatter, is a spray. It has one little ball, a bunch of little ones that are going to hit this paper, and nobody with any type of markmanship or um, uh, cares about actually being the type of person to say, yeah, I can shoot well, would hold this up as an example of how to live their life. Let me show you the, the next slide. That's a far different target. That one hit the center, so much so, and I don't know who this is, I just found it on the internet. But she wrote her name. Amy Peacock, 7106, 25 yards, two hand, open sight, 45 ACP. So she hit that target from 25 yards away, open sights with a pistol, 45, and hit the center. So much so, that was a great shot. She's bragging about it. Put it up on the internet with her name. And here I am talking about it 16 years later. Because that's the type of thing that you put up on your wall. I hit it. I hit it. But see, here's where the devil tricks us. He gets us to take a shotgun approach like the first one I saw you, showed you. Where God is a part of your life you're like, I, yeah, I mean, you know, God gets like one-tenth of my life. I mean, you know, I go to church, and by that, that means, you know, like seven times a year. I mean, I hit Christmas, I hit Easter. You know, it, God's on the paper. And yet, that's exactly what the devil does. Because distraction, watch this, distraction is the enemy of devotion. When we got married, those of us that are married, and this is the struggle with it, right? You're like, baby, I'm gonna give you one-tenth of myself. Right? Any woman be like, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm gonna give you one-tenth of everything I own. I'm gonna give you one-tenth of my time. 
No. You don't get into any relationship banking on giving them leftovers. But yet the devil is so smart that he distracts us in our walk. We're not symmetrical. We're not the same on both sides. We're one way at church, we're one way at home. We're one way at church, we're one way at work. We're one way at church, we're one way on 575. I've already told you my struggles with this, so I'm not saying I'm perfect, just like Paul. I'm not perfect, I haven't attained this. But there's one thing I do, though. Make my one focus. Why? Because I want my walk to match my talk. I want to be symmetrical. I don't want to walk as enemies of Christ. And this is where a lot of people, especially in today's culture, because the culture is so good, this culture is so good at beating us down when it comes to living our lives according to the truth. We live in a culture now that's post-truth. And not only now are we post-truth, but you create truth. It's my truth, it's your truth. We live like this. Look at verse 19. It's almost like the Bible knew this was gonna happen. The end is their destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. See, Paul was saying we have one aim, one focus, it's Jesus. And he's transforming us internally right now And one day when he returns, he will do the final transformation of transforming our bodies to be like him. But so many of us, watch this, will miss out on that ultimate transformation because we're not letting him transform us now internally. Because we live by our appetites. Notice he said their God is their belly. Now, that's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? Your God is your belly. What does that mean? Well, you know, we talk a lot about, like, go with what you feel. Especially today, it's, well, this is how I feel. I feel like I was created this way. I feel like I was born this way. So I'm going to give in to those feelings. But it's what's interesting is the seed of those feelings where we feel them It's not in our brains, even though that's what regulates them. It's in our guts, right? That's why we call it a gut feeling. That's why we say, go with your, what? Go with your gut. Ever had anybody say that to you? It's the worst advice you could ever give someone. Please don't ever say it again. What's better is don't go with your gut, go with your God. Because your God has the power to transform you, your gut doesn't. See, if I go with my gut, what's interesting now, just with the evolution of science and what we know, so much of your immune system lives in your gut, which is why we keep getting sick all the time is because we're very unhealthy. And that's the conversation no one wants to have. We are one of the most obese people in the the world. Because so much of our health comes from what we eat. And so much of our decisions are made by what we feel in our gut. Is it any wonder that we're sick? Now, this is why we're doing 21 days of prayer and fasting. 21 days of prayer and fasting helps reorient your appetite. Now, if you don't know anything about fasting, let me just give you a biblical, kind of a big, biblical rough shot of this. We have information on our website that's up now. But what fasting is, is I'm going without something, and biblically speaking, it's always food. Always. That, that is just the definition of it. I'm going without food, 
for the purpose of feasting on God's word. As Jesus said, I have food that you don't know about. And then the disciples are like, who fed him? Who gave him some Zaxby's? And Jesus is like, you don't get it. I'm not talking about chicken nuggets. I'm talking about the word of God. Because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So the reason why we fast for 21 days is because it reorients our guts. And here's what's amazing to me. Science has finally caught up with the Bible and has realized that fasting is incredibly healthy for you. It's amazing. It's almost like God knew what he was talking about. It's almost like he made this thing. So now there are, there's an entire industry built around the concept of intermittent fasting. You know, they used to tell us as soon as you woke up in the morning, you got to eat something, get that metabolism going. Now they're like, don't eat till one o'clock. Will you guys make up your minds? Breakfast used to be the most important meal. Now they're like, eh. So here's what I'm saying. Current cultural thought changes, so don't build your life on it. Well, this is what science says. Well, what science? Because science today is far more political than we would care to admit. Go with God. What does God say? Fast. So let me give you some details about fasting. We are going to fast starting January 17th. I was going to tell you we were going to start fasting tomorrow, January 10th, and you can't eat during the national championship game. (laughs) But we're not. Here's what we've done. It's almost like God worked it out for us. We're going to start a week after the national championship game, and we're going to end a week before Super Bowl. Perfect. Perfect. I'm so glad the NFL added an 18th game. They pushed it back a week. Thank you, Jesus. Because we've ended the fast before on Super Bowl Sunday, and then people stinking gorge themselves. That's dumb. Don't do that. So January 17th on Monday until February 6th on Sunday. That's 21 days. So as a church, we are setting aside 21 days to fast and pray. Now, let me say two things about fasting. I've already told you that fasting has to do with food, first and foremost. Well, every year, we have people that say, well, I'm just fasting from social media, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But here's what I want you to hear me say. I want to challenge everyone in our church to at least fast from food in some way. Everyone. And here's what I mean. There's different kinds of fast. Again, this information's on our website. You can fast from all food and just drink liquids. I have done that. You can fast from certain types of food like the Daniel diet. Only eat fruits and vegetables. No meats. I have done that. You can fast from sugar for 21 days. This might be a great thing for your kids to do. A lot of times this is what my daughter does, fast from sugar. You can fast from one meal a day. Just build in intermittent fasting. You can fast from two, I don't care. Here's all I'm saying to you, do something. Because your stomach is such a spoiled brat that will start grumbling to you about four hours after you ate last. And if you and I don't develop the discipline of saying, hush stomach, you are not my God. If you can't, watch this, if you can't develop the willpower to say no to your stomach, you will never develop the willpower to say no to your sin. because you'll be driven by your feelings. So we want you to take 21 days to set aside time to not eat in some way. Now here's the second thing, social media. I am asking our entire church, now this one may feel harder than food. I'm asking our entire church to fast from social media for 21 days. 21 days, yeah. So much so, watch this, 
We as a church, as an organization, will not post anything for 21 days. None of our social media will have any post for 21 days. Because we realize as we were talking about this that there's so many on our staff that still have to post stuff on social media during these times. No, I don't want you doing anything. Now, this comes with a little bit of a like, what? Because a lot of people run their businesses on social media, that kind of stuff. Listen, I firmly believe if you dedicate that time to the Lord, he will bless you. So we are not gonna post for 21 days, but that's how we get information out. We, we communicate to people on social media. We're not gonna, we'll make a post right before this starts that says we're not gonna do anything for 21 days. I'm encouraging you to take off all the apps from your phone. I've already taken them off mine. I did this weeks ago. Not because I'm better than you, but because as leaders, we have to sacrifice more to create a precedent for our team. And this is when you're like, but, but, but what if, especially teenagers, but what if I can't post stupid videos of me dancing in front of a mirror? <laughs> and teenagers, listen to me. Is, is that what the meaning of your life has come to? Maybe you need to reorient your narcissism. Because how much time do you spend on social media versus how much time do you spend in scripture? Now, I'm not trying to beat you up. I'm just saying, if you spend your life on social media, it will indoctrinate you and you will start living an asymmetrical life. Your walk will no longer match your talk. You will walk as though you're an enemy of Christ because you will walk like culture says to walk. You will define yourself by your sexuality, by your other identities, and not by your savior. And we wonder, what if we could reorient our life to a place where there's symmetry? I promise you, you will not regret doing this for 21 days. Why? If you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. Because you need to create grooves, not just goals. Create grooves, not just goals. What do I mean by that? I showed you the picture earlier of the shotgun approach. Well, here's what you may or may not know. Probably a lot of you do. But a shotgun, not only is the ammunition different, but the bore of the gun is different. It's smooth on the inside because that's what creates a scattered approach. But a rifle actually has grooves that are cut into the internal part of the rifle of the bore. And here's what it does. I got the definition on the screen, rifling. You realize that's why we call it a rifle because it's rifling. Listen to this. Machining helical, what's that next word there? Grooves. Wonder where I got the word from. Machining helical grooves internally into the gun's barrel. Now listen to this. For the purpose of exhorting torque and thus imparting a spin to a projectile. I love this. To stabilize it and improve its accuracy. Think about that. We have figured out how to rifle a bore of a gun to stabilize the bullet and make it accurate. But yet we haven't figured out how to create grooves in our own life to stabilize ourselves, to make our lives more accurate. Because remember, we only have one aim, and that one aim is to abide. Let me leave you with this question. What grooves do you have in your life to stabilize you and make you accurate in your aim? What grooves do you have? Notice how Paul said, walk. Well, walk has a pattern to it, right? 
I don't know if you've ever watched teenage boys walk or even some young men walk who are trying to be real cool. They kind of got to, you know, like something's wrong with them. You ever seen that? This sounds really weird, but one of my most favorite things to do in life is to watch how teenage boys act. Because they act all cool. <laughs> What's up, y'all? Right? Even how we drive. And you know if a dude's got a girl in the car, because if he doesn't, he's leaning to the window. If he does, he's leaning to the inside. All you you dudes know what I'm talking about. But you wanna know, and I'm not trying to like make fun of people, but go into a nursing home and watch how they walk. They ain't walking like this no more, are they? They're walking like this. Why? Because life has a way of beating the cool out of you. And I've joked about this before. This is why there's no gang fights in nursing homes. Think about it. This is the stuff I think about. (laughs) Because by that point in time, everyone has realized most have realized, I should say, that how they used to walk when they were younger was so dumb, trying to impress people. Here's what I'm saying, create grooves in your life, not just goals. See, goals aren't bad, but here's my problem with goals. If I have a bunch of goals and I'm taking this kind of shotgun approach to life, that I'm not rifling in on one thing and I'm not thinking about the grooves I need to create. So you might have a goal of reading 12 books this year, one every month. And let's say you got to the end of the year and you only read 10, not 12. Did you fail? No. Because the purpose, if you're wise, is not to read a bunch of books. The purpose is to create grooves, to create a pattern in your life that says, I don't want to just be amused and veg out watching a hundred hours of a Netflix series, but I want to think, I want to read, I want to grow. That's a groove. I want to create the groove of gathering with the people of God. I want to create that groove in my life. I want to create the groove of reading my Bible. As a part of this 21 days, we're going to put together a guide. It'll be available this week on our website. The information's there, but the guide will be there later where it's 21 days. And it's built very simply. You'll have two minutes of quiet. And then there's a scripture verse. And then the read method is read, examine, apply, pray. We just kind of go through it. And then you'll end it with two minutes of quiet. Those are grooves that you can create in your life that watch this, that stabilize you because they exert torque on you, which means pressure, and they force you to be more accurate. So we have one aim, and that's to abide. And all we're saying is during this days, let's create some grooves that stabilize us towards that one goal of abiding in Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us so much that even in our sin, when we rejected you, you came to us because you had one goal. That was to get us back because you knew that we cannot live our life apart from you. As Jesus said in John 15, apart from him, we can do nothing. And so God, I pray 
two things. One, for those who don't know you, God, that today they would come to know you and make you your one aim. And for those of us that do, we would rifle in our life on that one aim. Create grooves that honor you. Now, nobody looking around or talking, for those of you that have never trusted in Jesus, you've never come to a place in your life where he has become your one goal. He has become your one aim. Then today you can trust him. Be saved so that your life now will be in Christ. And when he returns, you will go to meet him. So if that's you, if you want to pray and trust Jesus right there where you are, you don't have to do this out loud, but you can pray with me. And it goes like this. Say, Father, thank you for loving me that you sent your son Jesus in my place for my sin. I ask you to save me, forgive me. I'm trusting in Jesus alone. He's my one aim. Thank you for loving me. Now, if you're in one of our locations and you just prayed that with me, would you just simply lift up your hand so we can see you? Just lift it up. Thank you. We got men and women gonna walk around, put a gift in your hand, and when they do, you can put it down. And if you just made a decision, whether you're in person or online, you can fill out our digital connection card at the end and let us know who you are. But then those of us who have trusted Jesus, as we prepare for this season of abiding, maybe ask the Lord right now, Lord, what do you want me to fast from? What does that look like for me? What food do you want me to fast from? Do you want me to fast from all food, certain type of food? And then go ahead and prepare your heart now for getting off social media to reorient your appetites around God so that you go with your gut less and you go with God. Not with how you feel, but what he says. Think about grooves in your life that you need to create. Father, I pray that you would bless this word. It is a word that we all need. Not just because it's the beginning of a new year. We need it all the time. But since we're at least thinking about these things right now, God, I pray that you would give us this one aim, this one goal in this new year to abide in you and help us to create grooves in our lives that focus us in, rifle us in on that goal of following Jesus. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.